Recording is on. Okay, uh, I guess recording is on. All right, so yeah, th thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to put some uh, faces to some GitHub handles and Slack, Slack handles. Um, right, so since this is the first time we're doing this and we don't really know each other very well, uh, aside from, from text and, and GitHub, it would be nice to do like a, I thought of doing maybe a general uh, introduction as a bit of an icebreaker. So if we could go around, uh, uh, I guess I can call out uh, people and have you say your name, what you do, where you are, and what's your favorite text editor or IDE. Uh, is that okay? So I, I, I guess I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll call, call on the next person, I guess. So I, I'm Leo, I'm a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. So I've just recently moved to the UK. Um, so I work mostly with gravity and magnetics, um, a, a lot of inverse problems and just developing software in general. Uh, now I'm having to expand that a little bit since I'm teaching all sorts of different things that I don't really know. So uh, it's exciting to learn some remote sensing and some uh, more thermal modeling and stuff like that. That's always nice. Um, and I've been uh, using Vim or NeoVim now for, uh, I don't know how long, but yeah, I, I just, I'm too lazy to pick up a, an ID and I should learn VS code, but yeah, I don't have time. <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess we'll, we'll go with the order that I see you here in the, in the call. So uh, Jesse, could you go next? Yeah, definitely. Um, my name is Jesse Peisel. I'm a professor of um, computer science here at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I work with primarily with freshmen, uh, incoming students here, and we focus on kind of the intersection of machine learning and uh, subsurface data. So um, we just kind of ra we wrapped up our first semester. And we had kind of a variety of different projects, everything from deep learning to data wrangling and everything in between. Um, I think as far as my favorite text editor goes or IDE, um, I think I'm kind of all over the place. I use everything from sometimes it's just easy to, easiest to use like Notepad and then jump over into Atom and everything in between. So I don't know if I have really a, a favorite one set. So whatever, I guess whatever gets the job done easiest. All right, nice. Um, so next on the list here is Chris. So Chris, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi everyone, um, I'm Chris Yeomans. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Camborne School of Mines. Um, I currently work in geothermal energy exploration um, for deep geothermal. Um, and to define deep, that is greater than four kilometers. Um, the term deep in geothermal varies depending on whether you work in soil geothermal, mine water geothermal, or or otherwise. Um, I'm I'm here really because actually um, a colleague of yours, Leo uh, Dave McNamara, um, told me about um, the Fatiando project and. I've subsequently found my way to you via Slack and and such things. Um, I've been quite quiet on there, um, just been watching. Um, but essentially, what I'm interested in is is I do a bit of everything with guys geoscience. I use Python more now. I started in R. I used to be a geophysicist and don't want to have to use Oasis Montage anymore. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm really interested in Fatiando as a, as a, whole, as a whole project. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd come along just to see what's going on, really. Um, as far as a, a favorite IDE or text editor, um, I've been very, um, very much focused on e either using R Studio when I was using R a lot, or um, I like to do all of my Python in Jupyter at the moment um, because I like being able to write around my 
terrible, terrible code to actually tell me what what it's meant to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, uh, uh, I got to remember to thank Dave then for for pointing you our way. Uh, and yeah, I guess a, a lot of us are doing this sort of stuff mostly to get away from Surfer and Oasis Montage and the like, I guess. <laughs> All right, so next on the list here is Agustina. Hey, hello. Um, I am from Argentina. I did me, uh, my PhD uh, with gravity and magnetic data. Um, here, the, my professor used was his montage, so is Fatiano is my alternative to process this kind of data. But now I am doing my postdoc, uh, modeling the subduction zones uh, with uh, numerical models, uh, working with people in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, um, right now, I in quarantine here in Argentina in my house, working. <laughs> yep. Um, so next is uh, Santiago. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Santiago Soler uh, from Argentina. Um, I'm doing my PhD. I'm I'm a physicist who is doing his PhD in geophysics. And yeah, Leo is my co-advisor of the PhD, so I work with him quite a lot. And I've been uh, in uh, connected to the Fatiano project since I started my PhD, or just a few uh, months before. And yeah, I I refused to use Oasis montage from the first day. So I said, no, I, I won't use it. I, I will call my my software or use some software that is available out there. And I mainly work with, uh, yeah, with potential fields and developing methods mainly. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, my favorite uh, IDE is I, I use NeoBeam for all my developing, but when I'm just researching uh, methods and that and working with data, I, I use a lot of uh, Jupyter notebooks. Um, but yeah, all my development on the on the libraries uh, are done in NeoBeam. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad we had this meeting now. Uh, we spend a lot of time with Leo talking on our regular meetings about Fagendo, and I think uh, I was I always thought that all all of the discussions we were taking would be nice to have it with more people. So I'm glad this is going on. Yeah, so that 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 was very well said. Yeah, we uh, yeah we had been discussing things in private for way too long, and, and it felt it, it always felt wrong to me that that we were uh, talking and making decisions in private. Um, all right, so last then is uh, other Leo. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Leo as well as Leo. And I'm a lecturer in a federal university here in Brazil. I did my master's and PhD in the magnetic telluric method. So you might be wondering what the hell I'm doing here. And there are two reasons for that. The first is I'm currently working with some uh, potential fields mineral exploration data regarding imaging a, a Kimberly body with a student of mine. The second reason is one reason that Leo knows already is that I'm um, I'm trying to I'm ha I'm glad that I heard your uh, your background opinions about Oasis montage prior 
to me introducing myself and my reasons because I'm trying to to offer a different solution uh, similar to as montage but affordable, accessible to everyone based on open source codes and that in the future when I have budget for that uh, we want that platform to communicate closely with researchers so we intend to to make your life easier at the same time you make my life easier so i have this uh this project that is ongoing uh we are very budget limited but we're getting somewhere so i'm here to know how and why do you use Fatiando? And as I heard, why were you not happy with OAS Montage? So how can I help you in the future? Maybe when you, uh, not only you researchers, but there are lots of people that don't know how to code and they are chained to only to commercial solutions and uh, for people here in Brazil, as montages, uh, it's very difficult to afford for a, a independent consultant. So we want to make that uh, mark this kind of solutions accessible to everyone and not only geophysicists, geologists that don't know to deal with data, how we know like the, the math behind it. So. We're trying to bring accessibility to this medium. So that's it. Ah, my favorite IDE today is Visual Studio. I use it for C++, for Python, or for Julia, for whatever it's possible to use there. I use it, it's very easy to use, like done in React, everything now is being uh, being building on React as our platform, so I find very easy to handle. All right, so thanks everyone for the introductions. Um, uh, I had thought of something, but I, I forgot. Are, you're not the only uh, person here with magnetotelluric background. Oh, nice. Sorry. You're not the only person here with uh, MT background. Oh, you as well. Yeah, a, a long time ago now, but uh, I'm sorry a couple for of years. And under Professor Jones, if you know him, mm. Alan Jones. Yeah. Ah, I know him uh, from yeah. names. Davis. I met him once or twice. He seems a very nice guy. Mm. Very, very clever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, there, there would be a, a third uh, person with MT background, uh, Craig Miller, but he's uh, based in New Zealand, and it's the middle of the night for him right now. So it's kind of difficult to schedule something between uh, Europe and New Zealand uh, in a time zone that's sensible for everyone. <laughs> Does Craig have um, a background at Adelaide University? Um, I think he's in the, the Geological Survey of New Zealand. Um, I'll look him up. I, I don't know if it's in Adelaide. Yeah, so he's he's uh, doing a lot of stuff with Simpeg as well. So it's nice that he started using Fatiando for for more of the data processing part, um, and then tying that into uh, work in Simpeg because it's a good bridge between all the the different projects. Um, but yeah, yeah, look him up. I, he's on the Slack as well. He's fairly responsive, but the uh, I, I can never get a synchronous conversation with him, mostly because I'm sleeping when he's working. So. <laughs> um, all right, so um, I don't know if you've seen, but we have shared notes on uh, a, a thing called HackMD. So this is a, uh, well, let me share my screen and that, that might make it easier. Right. Uh, all right. So 
it, when you first open the the notes, it should look something like this. And you should all be able to click on, on the edit button here on top. Um, and this is a shared markdown file. And you can everyone can edit. So it's like Google Docs, but in markdown. And we can sync this with GitHub as well. So we're going to be uh, doing that for, for sharing notes. So if there's anything you want to write down or, or um, I don't know, any idea as we talk, you can feel free to write down. And there's also a section here for putting down your names. So if you want to do that, I'll also put the link to the YouTube recording here. And we'll be reusing this document all the time. All right. So, um, right. So uh, I thought we could start with uh, um, just a couple of quick updates and then move on to some uh, discussion points that, that came up in the past couple of weeks. Um, so with regard to updates, the first one is that there's this online event going on in June called Transform um, that's been being organized in the Software Underground Slack. Um, and so this is going to be a free online event. Anyone can register. They're having a hackathon over the weekend and then tutorials and discussion sessions all through the week. Uh, there's also two sessions for lightning talks on Tuesday or Thursday and Friday. So if you have anything that you want to present quickly, like a five minute presentation, there's probably still slots available for the, the lightning talks. Uh, I think they have like over 500 people registered already for the event. So it's going to be kind of big, I guess, for, for an online event. Um, and so I'm teaching a tutorial on the Verde package there. So this is going to be a three-hour tutorial. Um, and yeah, so I thought I'd mostly do a walkthrough of uh, load some data and then do everything that we can to produce a grid at the end. So including doing stuff like uh, splitting training and testing data sets and doing cross-validation for the, the gridder parameters and projections and all that. Um, and yeah, so if, if anyone would be awake during the morning in Europe, which I'm guessing is not many of you. <laughs> 5 a.m. Brazil. I wish I could attend to that, but you know, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so that, that's fine. But if, yeah, if anyone is in, like can't sleep or is in that good time zone, um, if you could show up on the Software Underground Slack, that's probably where we're going to do a lot of the, the question and answer stuff. So any help to just keep an eye on the chat would be appreciated. But I, I realize that that's a bad time zone for almost everyone. <laughs> um, all right, so on that note, uh, a new development in Verde, some new cross-validation tools that, that I've been implementing. And these are mostly for um, splitting the data in a way that instead of separating points randomly, you divide them into blocks and then separate the blocks. And um, apparently, this is uh, much more representative of the actual uncertainty in the when you're doing cross-validation. Uh, so there's that. That's coming to Verde 1.4 or 1.5, 1 I think. So the, the next release is probably going to include these already. And, and a final piece of news is that uh, we, we actually got uh, Pooch is now being used by, by Scikit Image. So uh, for those who might not be aware, Pooch is one of the libraries that we develop in Fatiando. And it's actually not geoscience specific. It's a tool for downloading sample data sets. So this is what all the Fatiando packages use when when you do uh, when you load sample data. The pooch is downloading things in the background. Um, so Scikit Image recently started using, and their version zero point seventeen, I think the latest release, uses pooch. And
if you ran code in parallel, which of course we weren't testing against. So the latest release now should work in parallel as well. So it's uh, that was something that I was luckily able to fix quite quickly. Um, yeah, so it's it's nice having such a big project like that um, adopt the 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 library. I think that's going to be um, yeah probably a good thing in general. But that's kind of all I had from updates. Uh, does anyone have anything they they would like to share at this point? No. Uh, all right, so um, moving on then to longer discussion items. So the first thing we have here is, um, right, so default values in the boogie correction function in harmonica and also default values in general. So one problem I recently had is that I, I had a student trying to do a boogie correction on Mars and he forgot to set the density of water to zero. So, so when he was doing, he was running the boogie correction with the default densities. So that means that when we had a depression filled by nothing in Mars, uh, the calculation was being done as if that thing had water in it. And that was causing some very big errors, but some very hard to spot errors because the boogie anomaly it, it looked fine it didn't really look wrong but it was very wrong uh, in terms of scale uh, so that kind of made me think that maybe we don't want default values in these things like maybe people should have to set the value um, and so from from a user perspective i'm not entirely sure whether that's uh, Okay, if uh, avoiding this type of mistake is worth having to type out like explicit density values. But so I, I'm curious to know if, if anyone has an opinion on that or uh, if like whether we should just not have default values or whether, I don't know, we should try to throw an error or something at some point. I don't know. I've never used harmonica so far, but so I was asking, how does that work in, uh, like in detail? If you don't provide a value, it uses your default value, but you can't change the default value. You're asking if you should remove the option of default value, so the user will uh, mandatorily have to set the value. I would keep you the full values. I like, yes. and I think that the problem that you mentioned is very specific in, and for very specific expert, domain experts. So it's very uncommon to find someone who's correct, who's calculating the Google anomaly from Mars, for example. And there you don't have water under beneath zero depth so here here you have so probably most of the case where you do that kind of correction you are on earth where you have water beneath the zero meters value so i think our problem is very very specific so probably the person who would be doing that is a domain expert so I wouldn't change. I would keep my, the the full part. Hello, sorry, sorry, I dropped out of the call there for a little while. Uh, so I missed what you said. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, no worries. I think that the problem from Mars is very specific. So the person who's mm -hmm. using it must know that you don't have water there. So you have to explicitly. Uh, sets a density value for the booger correction. But probably the, the default values solve like 90% of the use case. 
If I'm guessing correctly, I wouldn't change that. I would keep the full values and leaving the option for the user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the main. Yeah, you're right that that uh, Mars is a a relatively rare use case at this time. Um, yeah, my, my main concern is that with the default values, most people don't bother even knowing that they're there. So I was just wondering whether it would be better practice to make you set your bouquet density values. Because even for the Earth, 267 is not always the best value. Um, Right, but but then again, like so I don't know if this is something that would happen if an a, a more experienced user was was doing this, but I think I might have made that mistake. Could could you could you mm -hmm. just adapt to have a prompt at the beginning of the of when you run the model to just say, do you want to proceed with default values? And then if people so wish to want to go and then edit them, A, they're reminded. Mm -hmm. um, Some kind of warning, right? And you, then they can just run the model, you know, something like that. Uh, that's a bit tougher to do. F uh, that That's something that could be done if we had uh, like a command line app or, or, yeah, okay. uh, or a GUI. But from the library perspective, it's a little bit trickier. The, usually yeah. when, when we have that, so we could put out a warning that we're using the default values, but I think everyone using the default values would find that warning very annoying. <laughs> so from my perspective, the user of Fatiano and Harmonica are more close to being experts than the opposite. So if a person that uh, is already uh, concerned with coding, understanding, and using a package like that is very likely to know these kind of details. In my humble opinion, I see that way. If you're talking about some, from some commercial perspective, like, okay, the Jesus in Oas montage, and the guys are uh, geologists that, that uh, he doesn't know, What's the role of this density in the process? Okay, I think that it could be safer to remove. But I maybe you should run a pool among your users. You know, using using that Slack feature for a simple pool. But I would keep that. Yeah, the the thing is that there's there's very few users of harmonica at this point, and I think anyone who's using it is probably in this call. <laughs> so so yeah, but um, yeah, but um, and yeah, I don't know. I think I think you have a point there that um, this does fit ninety percent of use cases, and um, but then. Yeah. Yeah. When, no, no. Yeah. You have that, a good point. Yeah. One thing that might be worth mentioning is that maybe the confusion is coming from the name of the argument. So uh, the argument name is something like density of water. And uh, maybe uh, worth changing the, the argument name to something more like the density below the the zero height or something like that. Because we are not distinguishing water per se. We are just assigning that value to um, to any height below zero. And it doesn't mean it that's water. Uh, in fact, in Earth, you can find some depressions without any water. And that could break things or give bad results. So maybe water changing the argument name to make it more clear. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's also, that's a very good point, especially when, if we're using, um, if we're using uh, ellipsoidal heights, 
then it's very likely that, that we don't have water um, beneath the, the reference. Um, I think the reason why I did water at first is because it's, it's very easy to forget whether you do crust minus water or water minus crust. Um, and I think the reason why I had density water is because then the function does uh, water minus crust correctly. Um, but th that's something else I came uh, when, when, when I was using the same function for not doing Bouguet correction at all, just doing a forward model. And it, it did feel very weird that I had to put density water when there was no water anywhere. Uh, and for Mars, that's particular, particularly a, a, a use case where there's no water. Uh, so yeah, I think that that's a good thing. And then we could remind people the right order in the doc string, I guess, instead of having to do it for them. How? I didn't get your suggestion. All right, so when we're doing the bouquet correction, when we're below the reference value, then we're kind of assuming that that's water. And then if it's water, the correction term should be density of water minus density of crust. But but that's only the case if there really is water. But you could have values of topography below the reference that don't have water, even on the Earth. So if you have places like like the Dead Sea or the the Dead Sea or or Death Valley in the U.S. or anywhere that's below sea level, you have negative heights and it's not filled by water. So in those cases, you would have to say density water equals zero, which is kind of weird because. It's, it's not that the density of the water is zero, it's that the, there's no water there. I see your point. But again, it's the same of the case from Mars. Like you have like 5% of the area of the land area on the Earth that has depressions below the zero height. And the way I see your problem is always a compromise between making it easier against making it right. So mm -hmm. uh, something that you have to choose. Uh, where are you? I would keep the way it is now. And like, if it's possible, as some warning. Remember that if you are on a, a depression area, change this value. Mm -hmm. This is the way it seems good. But... Hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of framing it, whether we're making it easier or we're making it right. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, personally, I, I would lean towards a, a compromise solution where we keep the default, but we rename the uh, we rename the variable and then use the right default value for standard crust and standard water density. Uh, so we could we could instead of saying density crust density water we could say density above density below, and have it default to, two sixty seven and minus one sixty something or. Uh, hmm. All right, so I'll I'll try to I'll open up an issue on that and I'll link to it in the the notes and I'll send that on Slack as well, so then we can continue this there in, in longer form, I guess, if required. Uh, th does that anyone else have an, an opinion on that? No? Uh, uh, final one, final mm -hmm. remark. Yeah. You, you can make things uh, more difficult to use in case you change the name of the variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm, when I say this, I'm talking about uh, non-domain experts. So people that knows about gravity, but they are not, they don't go deep as you go, for example. They just want you yeah. to run to see the result. So which can be in the future a considerable, considerable number of cases. But it's always like that. Don't have the what? I, 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 to to me, those are the people who shouldn't have the defaults. 
Yes, yes, those are. Because then it, it forces you to actually have to go in and think about it. Whereas with the default, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, to you're totally right. But at the same time, yeah. that may prevent people from use, from try and uh, give you the shots, you know, try for the first time. So it's always well, that's also where, where documentation can help, right? Yes. So if the documentation tells them like, yeah, standard densities to use are this and that, then. Uh, let, there's one point that may help. Who the majority of use cases are on Jupyter notebooks or on I, pure Python scripts? Why am I asking that? Am I asking that? Because if you could just uh, give a warning, and it's easier to do that on Jupyter notebooks than pure Python's, it's not popping something up, but only the red line. Watch out. You can it, be doing well. It's actually almost impossible to do that because Jupyter makes it very like there's no way to tell if you're running in Jupyter. Um, and I, I've run across this problem with PyGMT that I, I wanted it to know that, oh, if it's in the notebook, don't, don't uh, make a new window with the figure, just put it in the notebook. And there's actually no way to do that. But uh, you can uh, call a single message to, to show and if you're using like a, a common window it will be like hides in that black window full of white letters but, but it'll still be there yes but in the jupyter notebook it will be red and easy to see yeah uh, but that's it yeah okay uh, Let's Go ahead. move on. Um, right, so um, on the topic of boogie correction, one of the reasons why uh, we kind of wanted Craig on, on the, the meeting here is because he's coding up um, spherical boogie corrections. And it actually turns out to be a lot more complicated than, than initially thought because they, there's a lot of approximations in the formulas, and we've been discussing how to make those approximations more explicit and maybe get rid of some approximations when we have actual analytical expressions. So a lot of these things date from the time that people were gravity corral, and then really you couldn't have very complicated expressions, but we're, I, I like to think that we're beyond that at this point. Um, so there's no reason why we couldn't use closed form expressions instead of some uh, second order approximations. But yeah, so if uh, uh, I guess we'll skip that for now. But if anyone interested, there are uh, and what you do. Um, Right, so the, uh, another thing is um, that we've been trying to think is how can we organize uh, package maintainers? And that means one who is going to go and have a look at us and kind of review the pieces and things like that. So at, at the moment, um, either myself or Santiago have been doing um, all of the releasing and merging, but it would be nice to get more people on board, mostly because if something happens to either of us or we don't have much time to dedicate to anything, it would be nice if someone had had the means and the training to go and, and do this sort of stuff. Um, right, so there, there is an issue open for a discussion on that. And one of the questions we have is whether, like how, how can we establish a mechanism for someone becoming a maintainer and also for someone who kind of doesn't want to be a maintainer anymore? So how can they communicate and say that, look, I'm stepping down. So what, do we need any processes for that? Um, 
I don't know if anyone has any experience with this sort of stuff because we're kind of just trying to figure it out uh, as we go. No, I guess not. Um, all right, so one comment from from me, Leo. Um, yeah. I run um, uh, a website through the university where we teach various courses, and those courses evolve over time. It's all hosted on GitHub. Um, and we're now at a similar point where we might have people coming in um, to take over courses and other people leaving. We've looked at, um, I'll be honest, I'd have to check with some of the other guys involved in, in the project, but. Um, we've looked at assigning DOIs to particular versions um, and actually tried to keep the the who comes and does what quite open and, and rather informal. Um, one of the bigger questions was, what if someone picks up the course and only changes two slides out of 200? Are they, are they really redoing the course or did they just change the title slide to their name and the last slide to their email address um and it, i think an, a full and open discussion as, as you kind of suggested is is definitely necessary but you don't want to end up extending it there, there needs to be a point where you draw a line and say okay that's a version this is where we credit people to it and then once someone's fully stepped away, you can perhaps decide, okay, now we're going to move on with it. And this is another level to the project in terms of its history. Um, I don't know. I think, I think being able to have a sort of sign in, sign out system is a bit, perhaps a bit over the top for what you're trying to achieve, in which is essentially people coming in to help where, when and where they can. And you have to accept that people are going to have competing. Uh, interests for their time aren't they um, yeah no it's 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 good to know that that this i hadn't thought of that from the the course material perspective but of course that's also going to happen so well, one way we kind of tried to solve that was by introducing um authorship guidelines um, um a little over when was that a month ago or or so so we made this document outlining um Basically, if you work on Fationdo, how can you get credit, right? So we outlined several layers of, of credit, that, several levels that you could, um, um, or, or not levels, but several different ways in which you can get credit for your work. So at, at a first instance, if you make any commit at all to the repository, no matter if it's a simple typo, uh, at the least that that happens is that your name goes on the the change log when we make a new version. So when, whenever we publish a new version, we make a um, a change log. A slippery slope um, so so what, what we decided is that if you want to you can add yourself to this authors file that we have in the repo and if you do that then we'll include you when we uh, publish in a release we archive it on Zenodo to get a DOI and then if you put your name in the authors file we'll put you as an author in the Zenodo archive as well and then finally whenever we publish papers then we have a set of criteria where um, you're eligible to be an author if you have contributed anything. And again, we kind of decided not to really try to pass judgment on, on what you contributed. We're kind of trusting that people will be sensible. Um, uh, right, so it was, you have to have done anything in the project at all between the last release and the current release and or sorry, the, the previous paper and the current paper, and also review the paper itself. 
and add your your name, right? So we we kind of established that, um, and that is kind of copied somewhat from from what the Jupiter project has, um, and kind of adapted to to what, what we thought was was reasonable. But then the the issue is more with with the maintainer is not necessarily about people who come by and contribute a little bit. It's more about um, doing code reviews and, and releases mainly, actually. Um, yes, and uh, I want to yeah. divert your, your points about maintainers to, towards credit at all. Uh, it was more kind of, if you end up having lots of people involved, then it's going to come down to credit at some point. But yeah, I think my personal opinion is if you're going to have lots of people coming in to contribute and then whether they become a maintainer, you need some fluidity to that because ultimately people are probably not going to be um, paid for their contributions, I'm guessing. Yeah. So, uh, if only. <laughs> I, I think I think I think a Slack group that is where you make sure that you anyone that wants to be involved, and then you can have a specific channel for code review. Um, people can dip in and out of that, or be permanent members, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of have to assign it to people, and if people people can just say no if they're too busy. I don't. I don't see a formal way of doing it, in the, in the similar vein to how I've been running these this these workshops for course materials. I never tell someone to do it. I say, look, if you want to, please do it. That's the sort of that's what I was kind of getting towards. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think you're you're probably right. I just yeah. So I was just wondering, like, who because. Uh, doing the the maintenance stuff involves being added as an administrator on the on the GitHub account and on the well, it's mostly just a GitHub account. Maybe on Zenodo as well. Um, but there, there's uh, some admin stuff that goes on, so we kind of have to ask people if they want those responsibilities at some point. So I'm just wondering, like, how do we if Someone or, or how do we approach someone and ask if they are interested in doing this? Like, if someone is continuously coming by and helping out with the project, um, how should we maybe approach them and say, "Hey, do you want to be a maintainer?" Like, who who makes that call of should we invite this person to be a maintainer? Um, so I, I kind of like this lack idea. We could. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I was going to just say, is this. Is this not just a decision that comes down to ultimately the the, the project manager of of Fatiando? <laughs> uh, right now, yes, yes, it it does. Uh, I was kind of hoping that maybe it wouldn't have to be. Um, yeah, uh, this is exactly the same. Like, uh, it's up to you. You should invite the person. Come on, do you want to help me out with this? As since you contribute. So much to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've already bugged uh, Jesse quite a bit for for reviews and stuff and such. Um, so yeah, but I mean, we already do it that way. I was just wondering if maybe there's a better way to do it, but but yeah, I think we can probably just keep it that way for now. I guess I sometimes uh, it just has to settle on a decision maker. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, is today is <laughs> there, uh, bottleneck for you today? Do you have uh, problems with that? Or are you trying to anticipate the the growth of the community? Um, somewhat. So we don't have problems right now because Santiago took on quite a bit of work. Um, so, so he's yeah, he's basically he's the one running Harmonica and, and Rockhound. Um, so, been. yes, exactly. But then that that's still on because what what I don't want is to have one person having to do a lot of stuff. So if we could share work, it would be better. But yeah. So yeah, I was mainly thinking like, how can we encourage people to want to do this sort of stuff? So you want to figure out how 
people would gladly accept jobs that they won't be paid for and they will give them a hell of a headache, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> One million dollars question. <laughs> Uh, how can we sucker people into being contributors? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> can't help you with that. Uh, right. So, um, uh, one one thing I could do for now, then, because uh, right now it's only me and Santiago with uh, um, that that's doing most of this stuff. But um, I think we we actually had some people interested in in helping more in pooch at least um so one thing i could do is just make a slack channel um yeah i, I could make it private for now then and then just put whoever agrees to have uh administrator privileges in there and then we can talk like oh should we invite this person to be a maintainer does everyone agree and if so then we can go and reach out because it's kind of awkward to have that conversation in public. Because if someone doesn't want to invite that person, then it's like, oh, yeah, that creates a kind of a bad situation. You can maintain a steady uh, amount of uh, graduate students <laughs> and assign them <laughs> this kind of test. No, that costs money. <laughs> So it's not like in Brazil where graduate students are free. The water PD. <laughs> yeah, you could maintain a steady supply of graduate students. <laughs> oh my guy. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, if I have that, I can offer you some. When I find them and willing to work with Patiano's projects, for sure I will assign that for them. I thought you were just trying to pull me that, that task. I was just saying goodbye. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll bully you soon enough. Uh, wait, I can't spell. Okay. Um, okay, so... The next point is something that I think Santiago wrote this down. Uh, the more than two dimensions in, because right now Verde and Harmonica, they do everything just in two dimensions. So you can't really make a, you can't interpolate a data volume and you can't do 3D interpolation. Uh, so yeah. Santiago, do you wanna tell us about, about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there are several issues on pull requests on Verde. Um, trying to extend the capabilities to uh, n dimensions. So, for example, if you want to create this uh, volumetric grid instead of 2D grid, uh, you can. And <clears throat> I've been working since around uh, six months, kind of, uh, with Aculent layers in Harmonica. We currently have an Aculent layer class. And it's using, basically it's uh, subclassing the base grid in Verde. And uh, we stop upon some issues with that because harmonica griders, we found out that they are a little bit different because um, harmonica griders uh, use Aculean layers, Aculean sources also known as. And basically, uh, they create a set of point sources below the data. Uh, we use the data for feeding the coefficients of those sources in order to the sources to recreate the data and then use the sources to predict values on a grid. For example, if you want to grid uh, potential fields by uh, data. So, the problem with that is that we've been using uh, the Verde base grider that, uh, for example, it just grids two dimensional data where you pass some easting and northing coordinates. 
But with the harmonic aggregators, the issue is that you also need the uh, height of the data. And also when you're predicting or greeting, for example, you need the height of the grid. So we found some issues with that. Uh, so we found that subclassing the verde class as it is now is not a good option. But on the other hand, it's not like harmonic aggregators would be 3D graders because we are not intended to create like volume grids on harmonica, just these 2D grids, but with this additional coordinate that is the height of the grid. Um, so uh, we were discussing about how to manage this. And on the last meeting we had with Leo, um, we kind of decided that it would be better to create a new base class for harmonica graders, where the height of the data and the height of the grid, uh, it's not just passing an extra coordinate or something that is patched into the class just to make it work, but it's very, it's a key to the, to the class to work. Uh, so yeah, we've been discussing this for a lot and, and trying to solve it uh, one problem at a time, but we found that it's part of the, of a larger problem that is mainly due to the nature of the greeters. And so we, I, I kind of decide, I'm, 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 I'm in favor of creating a new base class for harmonica greeters. So wanted to know what, um, what do you think about this and if you have any experience or ideas. Or questions also. Maybe I, I haven't <laughs> expressed I mean, myself. I don't, I don't know if I got that correctly. I don't okay. know any solutions or how whatever how to help you, but I think that Bailey Sullivan was working on something similar to that. So I would uh, check his GitHub and talk to him. He seems a very approachable guy, but I I think so. I will highlight that I think that he's trying to solve something similar to what you are trying to. No. Uh, okay. So was this for 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 Pi Vista or something like that? Yes. For, uh, yeah, he was trying to, uh, I, I actually, I, I can't even name what was he trying to do, but it sounds similar to what you were trying to do. Some like 3, 3D splining of something more volume. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, I will try to explain myself there. Um, the proposition in Verde of extending the capabilities to n dimensions would be like creating a really multi-dimensional grid. So uh, uh, you would have like a northing, uh, an easting northing and upward uh, coordinates, and you have nodes on each you have points on each node of the grid. But in harmonica, uh, although we don't need, uh, at least for now, we don't want to have complicated 3D uh, the grids, the height of the either the grid we want to predict on or the data or the points we are creating with the Kilian sources are a um, very important factor for the method to work. Uh, without it, the method doesn't work. So uh, as it is now, it's like a patch. I mean, it, you pass the co in the our coordinates uh, into the feeding method, um, 
and it's working, but when you predict on a grid, for example, the height, you have to pass it like an extra chord. And the extra chord is a keyword argument. It's not, um, uh, you can ignore it. But if you forget to pass it, you get some strange errors because uh, it's not prepared to, to raise, uh, like you're missing the, the upward coordinate of the grid. So um, yeah, so that's, mainly the reason because we are thinking about creating a new subclass for harmonica greeters, uh, especially for equivalent layer greeters. Um, so uh, another problem that this causes is that um, in Verde you can give the, when you're making a grid, you can give it a projection function. So for example, you can have a gridder that's, you, you fit a model in Cartesian coordinates and you can make a regular grid in geodetic coordinates. So you can make a, like a let long regular grid using a Cartesian, uh, a Cartesian gridder by giving it a projection. But that only works if the, because the project, projection only takes two coordinates, right? So it's only latitude and longitude. But in harmonica with equivalent layers, you need latitude, longitude, and height for, for doing the prediction. So then when we try to do the projection, it fails because you have an extra coordinate in there. And there's actually no easy way to know if the projection function, so if, if we're getting three coordinates or not, it's, it's not really that easy to do in the, in the code at this point. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so it's, it's not easy to come up with a generic solution that would work in Verde and then also work nicely in Harmonica. Uh, and I think, let me tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, you would like a a very elegant solution to work on both. Ideally, yes. Okay, but yeah. I don't think that exists. <laughs> That's yeah. the problem. <laughs> okay, but uh, we will be happy with uh, adapted solutions to each case. Because... So, yeah, the, the, the problem with... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the main thing is that we were just hoping that someone would have a, a great idea for not having to do that, because then that that means that now we have to do things in two classes instead of one. So usually the less code we have, the better, because less code means less bugs. Yeah, then uh, that will give you the double twice as problem in maintaining. So. I understand, but, but I can't help you. Sorry. Yeah, the, the thing I've been struggling with is that the base classes will be very alike, but, uh, and, and that's like a problem, right? From the maintainer view, because you have very uh, light code that you have to maintain separately. So as Leo said, if you change something on the base class because you found some problem or you want to extend this, their capabilities, you, you will also have to make it on harmonica. And that also means writing new tests, new tests. And yeah, it's, it, it would be better to not repeat code and trying to work out a, an easy solution. But yeah, now I think they are inherently different uh, from just a nature perspective. So I'm thinking that we're having two different base classes, although they, they are doing uh, almost the same thing. Yeah, so what I gather from that is that there are no magic solutions, I guess. Uh, we can we can keep looking for a little while, but uh, yeah, I I think we're just gonna have to move forward on that. Uh, but the the equivalent layers on on harmonica are turning out really nice. Uh, 
Santiago is currently working on, on a way to run them. So you could run a, a, a huge equivalent layer without running out of RAM. Because right now, the, the main trouble with the, these gridders is that if you have 10,000 data points, then you need to be creating a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. And 10,000 is fine. If you have 100,000, then that becomes a problem um, where you just run out of RAM. Um, so, so that's one thing that we're kind of excited to see when uh, um, hopefully we'll have a paper on that soon. But where we might have a way to run it, uh, exchange processing time for RAM. So in that way, you could you could grid uh, uh, like half a million points without any trouble as long as you wait enough. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll see. Uh, anything else on the on the gridders? Now it's okay for me. Uh, we can continue discussions on the issues. Uh, if I think I will open an, a pull request for drafting some new base class for the harmonica grader. So if anyone wants to say, thumb, say something on contribute, it's OK to join them. Yeah, it's good to have the starter code, because then that will come. I and mean, problems will surface as you try to implement them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, so the. Final thing I had here was something I thought of yesterday when looking at all the psychic image stuff is um, uh, a, a problem that I've come across is that some of uh, all of our packages have sample data sets. So Verde has a, a bunch of sample data sets. Harmonica has its sample data sets as well. Um, but sometimes we kind of want to use the same sample data set in one package or another. Um, so, for example, I kind of wanted to use uh, some of the harmonica sample data on the documentation for Bool or for Verde. And the only way to do that now is if you um, make it a somewhat of a development dependency. But then having all the packages depend on each other creates a, a circular dependency problem. Right, where sometimes you can't even upgrade because, oh, this one depends on that one, which depends on this one in turn. And that, that creates a lot of problems. Um, so one thing I thought is maybe we could have a, a Fatiendo data package or something like that that has all the sample data sets. And then we could use that same package in all the other ones. So then instead of depending on each other, they all depend on this one package. Um, and yeah, so that, that might free up a little bit. Uh, it might make it easier to uh, use these uh, sample data in, in different things and also when doing tutorials and things like that. Um, yeah, so that, I don't know. That, that was basically just throwing it out there. And does anyone have any strong feelings on, on any of this? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, th I think I agree with merging all data sets into one single package. Uh, now, yeah, I, I, I tend to forget where some data set is stored in. So sharing Poly Verde or Harmonica or is it in Rockhound or, um, but so I, I would agree. Uh, the main difference would be that the packages store their own data while Rockhound uh, uses uh, data that is uh, available somewhere else. So maybe worth uh, differentiating these data sets that are already included in our repositories and keep Rockhound to manage all data that is stored elsewhere. Yeah, so the, the main goal here is that these would be things that we would use in, in tutorials and in the documentation. So it has to be relatively small files that we can download quickly and repeatedly on, on, on continuous integration. And so if we're running a tutorial, we don't want people to wait 30 minutes for, for a big data download. 
uh, it should happen really fast. So, so yeah, I guess that's kind of the separation. But it, it could also be included in Rockhound. It would feel kind of weird to have two packages that have data, whether it's actual usable data versus just sampled for 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 documentation. Um, so yeah, that's the part that I'm not really sure. Like, what 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 would what would it be better to keep the package um, we have or or make a new one? What if the Fatiendo data package it's hidden to the user? So if you are using Harmonica, for example, you have these uh, Harmonica data sets, and then you would have any data set inside the Fatiendo data. Or even if you are using Verda, you will be uh, available, you will have uh, the same data sets available through the same logic. So it's like the user doesn't have to import Fatiendo data. Um, and Rock Home can have the same access. So if you want to download the data through Rock Home, you could. So you will have a single. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Or maybe it's too complicated and just moving everything to Rock Home would be simpler. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so that that can be done. So we could we could add the new package as a dependency and then have the data set modules in each of the other packages uh, dynamically or, or just import everything from the data package. But that would mean repeated functions in all of the packages. Um, uh, and what what is the problem with that? Uh, I'm just wondering if it would be confusing. Because of the, the approach of having that uh, link it in all packages, the, your data set package accessible from all of your packages makes sense to me. As a user, it's something that I I would like to have without bothering installing another package. However, it, especially because you don't have to download every day, you like you query the data set you want, then it, you fetch it. But as a end user, it makes sense to me to have everything accessible from every package. No. And this data set pack no. being a separate one. But I don't know from the uh, programming point of view if that makes sense. OK. So uh, wait, let me just uh, write this down. <laughs> Because in the end, nobody will watch the recording, so write that down. Yeah, no, of <laughs> course not. Uh, <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so that that's a good that's a good point. Um, the one thing is that you will have to install the package anyway. It, it it'll just be automatic because it would have to be a dependency, um, right? Because what what I don't want is for the module to exist if you have the data or not exist if you don't because then th that gets confusing um but i kind of don't want to make so w one of the things that we could do is not make this package a, a mandatory dependency because if you're using fatiano to just do your work you don't really care about the sample data so sample data is mostly if you're trying something new or if you if you're if we're teaching or, or things like that or for the documentation but if you're just using it to process your own data, you generally don't really need the sample data. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea of separating it so that you only install it if you want to use it. But, but yeah, then that, that creates its own problems, I guess. So yeah, I I quite like the current um, way to access the data because you have the package uh, data sets and then you 
can autocomplete and see all the available data sets. That's very interesting. Um, and you don't have to remind to import some another package. You just have it when you already imported Verde or Harmonica. But yeah, that would be nice to have all the data sets inside Fatiando and not only the ones reserved to Verde if you have imported Verde or Harmonica. So that was my idea. But yeah, I, maybe we should we should start coding some uh, some of the, these things and see if it's possible. <laughs> Sometimes when you think about these years, yeah, it's completely possible, and then you find out now it's <laughs> it's a pain. <laughs> So, so one thing we could do is is make it mandatory, like just make it a mandatory dependency, and have the the individual data sets import star. So, so just import everything from the data package. Um, the reason why we could probably make it mandatory is because it, it would have very little code and it would have no dependencies, or no, it would have dependencies, right? It, it would need to have stuff like numpy and 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 pooch at least um yeah but those are all dependencies that all the packages already have anyway um and since it it would be a very small package it would just be a little bit of code it, it wouldn't have to download data or anything like that the data would that's the whole point of it just the data is downloaded automatically so now the data is not downloaded when you fetch, but when you install the library. That's what you're proposing. Or... Oh no no no. Okay. No, I'm saying it's probably fine to have the library as a constant dependency since it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really do much. Okay. Yeah. Sure. In fact, you're you're in, uh, adding Pooch as a dependency of Harmonica. Right? Yes. Even if you're not using it. So the, the tricky thing there is handling releases then. Because the, the thing with that is that if you upgrade Fatiendo data, you can get new functions in the Harmonica library, for example, without updating Harmonica. OK. Yeah, you're right. So then that gets a little bit weird. Or it, it, it could cause problems, I guess. Well, pro it probably wouldn't cause problems because nothing really is using, inside of the packages, nothing really is using the data sets package. Right? Mm. So it's kind of self-contained. So I, I don't think it would cause problems in the rest. But it might be confusing if suddenly you have a new function in there and you don't remember touching anything. Okay. Uh, one very junior question. When you include it as a dependence, it installs automatically when you install your, uh, when you install Harmonic, for example. Yes. I like that that way. Uh, but w what it wouldn't do is update it. Yeah, no, I, I understand the counterpart of it because when you update it, you probably have to run the tests again and like change the release number and details not concerned to the main core of Harmony, for example. Yeah, uh, so, so actually what, what I mean is that if you update Harmonica, you don't necessarily update the data package as well. So for example, if we make or if we make a new release of the data package with a new data set, right? So if you update Harmonica, you don't get the updated data package unless you explicitly auto uh, update the data package or you update everything. But I don't get the problem of updating out, automatically updating the data package when you update Harmonica. 
Uh, right, so it, it, it wouldn't. Unless harmonica depends on a specific version of the data package. So, for example, if we if um, harmonica depends on NumPy, right? So, if you update harmonica, it won't necessarily update NumPy. So, if you do conda update harmonica, it probably won't update NumPy or SciPy or anything. I got it. Thank you. Right, so th this feels like the kind of clever idea that every single time I've had it before, it, it always turns out to not be that clever. <laughs> uh, I, I, I see. Uh, you, apparently, you're, uh, you're trying to anticipate problems. In this <laughs> and it's really, it seems difficult, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, you don't know how to predict the behavior of how things will happen. So I actually I don't have inputs for this, this yeah. solution, just uh, concerns as well. <laughs> and, and that's why making software is hard, because once you make it, it it's very easy to add things. It's not easy to remove things. Because then, then people get angry because uh, you removed something that they used, or you fixed the bug and they relied on that bug. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's not it's not an easy thing. But yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll I think I'll open an issue somewhere, maybe in Rockhound for that, and we can talk further, I guess, uh, or or just think about it some more and see if we can spot any major issues. Um, and uh, so I think Santiago just wrote here about making a Fatiando meta package. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that, that's, I, I like it. So you could, you could do stuff like conda install Fatiando and then you get all of the different modules instead of getting an actual package called Fatiando. It's kind of like you can install Jupyter and there's no program called Jupyter. They're all different sub programs. Um, yeah, that, that's something that was advert, advertised when you decided to split um, the Fatiendo project into several libraries. And now I think we have a pretty nice population of libraries that was adding the this Fatiendo meta package. Um, so yeah, that would be nice, I think, to have. Uh, especially for newcomers, uh, or if you're teaching a course or something, you just say conda install Fatiando and you have uh, all the libraries. Uh, just watch out because, watch out because older users will yeah. get... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did I cut you because I stopped listening to you and then I thought you were done. Santiago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Sorry, uh, I think my video is lagging, so maybe I. But yeah, yeah. Continue, please. Okay. So probably if you do on some conda install Fatiando, you get a lot of complaints from older users that use the 2.7 version of Fatiando, as I still do. So I see that as a nice to have, not a must have, especially because. Yeah, I, as I see, your the users, they are domain experts. They don't <laughs> see problem going, typing conda install blah five times. So, but it's a nice thing to have. It will make it will make li users life easier. And I think that in in the end, that's a big part of the purpose that you all have. As someone who used the uh, 2.7 version um, probably six months ago now or more and then realized, oh, yeah, this doesn't work on Python 3 and then get, having to understand the new um, structure, I think actually the meta package is a good idea, personally. 
Agreed. Mm -hmm. But but then would you still want it's to really be able nice to... It's really nice to hear that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, w would you still want to be able to import Faciando? Because uh, what I think what Santiago was talking about is that you can install it, but then you would still import Verde, import Harmonica. No, I think I think having the meta package, uh, it's, it, what I mean is it brings together the project as a whole, rather than when I first read up on the new structure and how you're splitting things up. Whilst I understand. Now I've read through everything. It, why it makes sense? It it feels like you've got lots of blocks, but I don't, I don't see what you've built from those blocks. Whereas if you still have the umbrella of Fatiando, then that that carries on from what you had before with Python two point seven, but reinforces that this is this is a cohesive project. Right. That that's a good point. Um... Uh, on, on on that note, I, I had been feeling this as well that it, it doesn't right now the the project is several individual projects. Um, there is some interoperability between them, but there is no documentation that uses everything. So uh, it would be nice to have the meta package. And one thing I thought of as well is having a a like project-wide uh, set of tutorials that that does that, that uses everything. So that could be like online uh, notebooks that you can run on Binder, for example, that they could load data from Rockhound and combine that with something from Harmonica and something from Verde and something from Bool, for example. I think if you were to be able to write a tutorial notebook that pulled in every every aspect, I think you get a lot more subscribers to the, the sort of the Fatiando project as a whole. Okay. Yeah, that that's a that's a good idea. That should be one of the. Uh, I'll try to make that one of my priorities uh, for the next couple of months. As someone who's who's yet to venture into the new structure, and is pretty bad at coding, I I might be able to help in testing out any tutorials. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I'm going to start working on the Verde tutorial soon. So if you want to have a go at that, uh, I'll, I'll post on Slack whenever that's uh, ready for a trial. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Uh, OK. OK, um, so I think that's all we had for today. And we've gone past an hour already. Um, so I kind of don't want to keep this too long. But yeah, uh, just thank you, everyone, for coming. It was really nice seeing everyone. Thank you for getting all the input. Um, yeah, sorry, I, th I think I talked way too much on, on this one as well. I would rather have more people talking next time, but uh, we'll, we'll try to do a better job. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll post the recording of this if anyone has any interest. And I think we'll try to do these monthly at least so that once a month at least we can check in and, and see what's progressing and, and how things are going. Um, any final words? Uh, just thank you for ho hosting an open, open community discussion. I thought it was great. It's my first time doing this, so I thought it was great. Yeah, thanks for coming. I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Keep on that good job that you all are doing. Yeah, thanks for hosting this. It's really cool to chat with everybody and see what, you know, like actually be able to discuss rather than kind of like get that morning list of what all's happening. So this is really cool to see and actually discuss and see some of the challenges that are popping up. Thanks for putting this on. That was huge. Yeah, me too. I'm I'm glad this this is happening. I I was expecting it uh, since a long time, so I'm I'm really happy with this. Uh, and one final word. 
try not to do what uh, Jesse T-shirt is saying. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't know. It's my first time to do something like that and contribute with a, a, a project like Fatiando. In general, I, I only did my code and for my work and only that. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for coming, Agustina. And thanks for all the help in, in Rockhound. All right, so uh, I'll let you all get back to your days. And uh, yeah, OK, so talk to you online and then maybe see you next month. All right, take care. Have a good weekend. Bye, take care.